Amen. Come on, church, put your hands together. Amen. Well, we're so excited you're here today. If I hadn't had an opportunity to meet you, my name's Todd, and I get the opportunity to serve the lead pastor along with my wife and our family here at the church, and we're just excited about what God's doing in the ministry and in this place. Encourage you to be a part of everything that is going on. And man, I've been uh, loving this series this summer uh, because partly because I'm ADD and I didn't have to stay in one text. So we got this week, this is week number nine. All right, this is next week's going to tie the longest we've ever had for a series. Um, and we'll be ten, week 10 and then we're going to jump in to a little bit. We're going to focus in, uh, in in the month of August uh, on Romans 8. We're going to spend four weeks in one chapter, uh, one of the greatest chapters in all the scripture. So we're excited about that. But if you're a guest, I want you to grab those notes and jot a few things down. If you got your Bibles, we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 8. 18 is where we're going to be at today. Um, and if, you, if you're a guest, we've been kind of looking at just Old Testament stories and just seeing what we can learn from them and how we can learn and grow. And, and so uh, my heart's full. I'll probably spend 25 minutes on point one like I did last week. Um, I've never preached on this text like I did last week. If you missed last week, um, it, it's awesome. Uh, so go, go check out uh, about, about the donkey uh, and uh, Shrek's in the Bible. If you didn't know it, it's awesome. Um, and uh, so First Samuel 18, and um, I'm going to give you everything, every, everything I got, and, and I will try to get us out on time. Um, but I'm excited about what God's given me and, and put on my heart today. First Samuel 18 is really a, a character uh, study in character. It, it is a master class in reaction. And what we're going to see in the text is there's two people. There's King Saul. Everybody say King Saul. One, two, three. King Saul. Come on, everybody. King Saul. One, two, three. King Saul. And then there's the prince, Jonathan. Everybody say Jonathan. Jonathan. And so he is the next in line to be king. Uh, and, and what we see in here is the reaction, King Saul's reaction uh, to David after defeating Goliath. And uh, then we're going to see Jonathan, the prince of Israel, uh, his, his reaction. And, and what we're going to see is the character will come out. There, there is a contrast in character. In fact, when we read the text, you'll see two di distinctly different characters uh, all, between King Saul and Prince Jonathan for the nation of Israel. Now, David's our third character, but he's really just a sidebar today in 1 Samuel 18, because when we get to 1 Samuel 18, uh, David has just defeated Goliath. And if you're not even a church person, you probably get that idea. David has just defeated, defeated Goliath. I'm telling you, he is, his popularity, he's trending on Twitter. Uh, I mean, it, it is amazing. Uh, they're, they're, they're chanting his name, David, David, he's our man. If he can't deal it, no one can. It is amazing. They're watching his clip on YouTube, he sung the rock. He's like, watch this. You know, like people are going crazy um, um, with his influence and his popularity. He is selling out conferences. Some of you are like, I've never read this version of the Bible. All right, this is the TFB. This is Top Four's international version. I'm just trying to get you to see that David uh, is, is on the rise. Uh, and when we get to 1 Samuel 18, Saul knows that God has taken the kingdom from him for his own disobedience. We learned that earlier in 1 Samuel. He just doesn't know who and he doesn't know when. So when we get here, I want you to see the character. Let's jump in verse number one, 1 Samuel 18. Here's what it says. After David had finished talking with Saul, because when you beat Goliath, you got to go talk to the king. After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit. That's the prince of, uh, of Israel with David. He loved him as he loved his own self. From that day, Saul kept David with him and did not not let him return home to his family. And Jonathan, check this out, made a covenant with David because he loved him as he loved himself. And Jonathan took off his royal, if you like extra notes, right above the robe, royal robe. He took off his royal robe he was wearing and he gave it to David along with his, and if you're like, if you're in an NIV, if you're in an NKJV, it's going to say armor. But if you're in an NIV, it says tunic, right? Military. So his royalty and his military tunic along with, check this out, even his sword, his bow, and his belt. Whatever mission Saul sent him on, David was so successful that Saul gave him a high rank in the army. This pleased all the troops and the Saul's officers as well. When, they were, uh, when the men were returning from home after David had killed the Philistines, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul, singing and dancing with joyful songs, with timbrels and lyres. And as they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. Saul was very angry 
This refrain, refrain displeased him greatly. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands? What more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. Saul kept a close eye on David. I want you to help me with my title. I want you to look at the person on the right or left, the one you like the most. Just go ahead and do that. Pick them. And I want you to say, what are you looking at? Go ahead. Some of you may want to say it anyway. What are you looking at? Anybody like people watching? Anybody like people watching? Oh, come on, get your hands up. I'm, I'm going to watch you after service. I love people watching, especially in the airport. Come on. Man, I get the one right there by the concourse where everybody is walking, and I am judging you. Like, if you wear pajamas to the airport, I am but I am. I'm doing that. Hey, the one I judge the most is the dude that shows up with no luggage. How are you going to be in the airport with no luggage, not even a backpack, looking like a serial killer? Come on, somebody. <laughs> like you're just strolling on with nothing. I think something's wrong with you, man. I do it in the gym, too. I, I, I like watching people. How many of you like to work out? You actually enjoy it? Uh, all right, not many, okay. How many of you hate to work out, but you do it anyway? All right, all right. You just want to live a little longer, right? Yeah, yeah. I hate it. I, I work out so I can eat Mexican food. Come on, somebody. That's right. <laughs> That's right. I love Mexican food. So I was eating lunch the other day at uh, Vallarta's. Come on, somebody. Vallarta's. And, uh, and I'm probably not saying it right. It's like, you, you, you cheating on El Paso. No, I am an equal opportunity Mexican eater. Come on. I, I will go to El Toro. Come on, somebody. That's fun to say. El Toro. And I will get the LP1. If you don't know about the LP1, you missing out. See there? Because I like it all. So therefore, I have to work out. Now, I believe there's one part of working out that Satan invented. It's called cardio. Anybody hate running? You hate running? Like, I, I mean, I hate, and I hate running on a treadmill. Like, I hate it. So, so what I typically do, like last summer now, I work out at home, so I don't get to do this much anymore. I started working out in my garage because I couldn't focus because <laughs> I was looking at everything going on around me. Uh, but last year on vacation, I found a gym, and I go in, there's like 87,000 treadmills. And what I do is I look for someone a little less athletic can, than me. That's right. I don't care how many treadmills are open. I look for somebody I think I could beat in a race. And if you've ever wondered why when there's 20 treadmills open, that there's a weird dude that stands, hi, I'm the problem. It's me, all right? Because that's me, and I think I can beat you. Because when I step on that treadmill, we are in competition. Anybody know what I'm talking about, all right? So last year, I'm running on the treadmill, and there's like 87,000 treadmills in this gym, and this dude comes and does it to me. Dude looking like he's sponsored by Under Armour. I was like, ooh, I know what you're doing, dog. I know what you're doing. I knew what he was doing. I mean, he gets over there. He's stretching at the treadmill. He doing all of this. I know exactly what he's doing. And I, 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 I knew it at a five. A five is not a jog. A five is not a run. But before he jumps on there, I'm amping that baby up. I am climbing in speed. Because you know what? I know what he thinks about me, and I am not going down without a fight. Hallelujah. I feel like God in this place. You know? <laughs> and here's the deal. He beat me. Uh, so <laughs> Cause this dude, I didn't even know the treadmill went to 15. This dude start at 15. I'm like, I'm out. And here's the deal. Like I cannot, I could not focus on what I was doing because I was focused on him. All I was focused on was how fast he was going. How are you doing? What are you doing? What, you know, he made Under Armour look good and I didn't, you know. And that's funny like in the gym and it's funny in the airport. It's just not funny in life. Like how you cannot focus on what you got to do because you are so focused on other things going on around you. See, what I figured out is that all of us, we can all be a Saul. Oh, we can all keep a close eye on our circumstances. Oh, we can all keep a close eye on our problems. Oh, we can all keep a close eye on our worries. Oh, we can keep a close eye on everything and anything at the same time. And here's the problem with that. The problem is this. When we focus on everything in life but the giver of life, we lose direction. So this week, this week, my goal has been, hey, can we just begin to learn to look for God? 
Can we begin to learn to look for his goodness because any bozo can point out the bad. Any bozo can criticize somebody. Any, anybody can find the flaw in anything, but it takes faith to find the goodness of God in a chaotic world. And I want to see the opportunity in the broken situations of life. I want to see God's opportunity in broken people. In fact, I don't want my eyes on anything that God is not in. Come on, if you with me, say amen. So let me, give you, let me give you these points and, and unpack this text and see if it can help us today. Number one is this. In a world of Saul's, be a Jonathan. Yeah. Oh, come on. In a world of Saul's, be a Jonathan. We have a world full of Saul's. Insecure Saul's is what I call them. Fake and temperamental Saul's. Comparing Saul's. Jealous Saul's. Be a Jonathan. In a world of Saul's, it's looking at the peripheral. Be a Saul and be present in the moment. I mean, be a Jonathan and be faithful in the moment. Be, be a Jonathan and put your phone down and actually experience life with people. Yes. Remember, remember when we used to do that? Remember when we used to do experiences? Remember when we used to do things and didn't just watch other people do things? Remember that? Yeah. Remember when we used to actually play video games and not watch gameplay of video games? Some of you, you don't have kids or grandkids. You don't know what gameplay is. Gameplay is this thing where you watch other people play games. And so a couple, this has been probably a couple years ago, now I walked in and Carter's watching and it was Super Mario 3, come on somebody. The best Mario game of all time, Super Mario 3, the original NES, and I thought he, I had bought him one of the, the original NES and I thought he's playing, and I, and I was like, hey man, what's going on? And I look in and it's, and it's Mario 3, I'm like, oh cool, you're playing Mario. He's like, no, I'm not playing it, I'm watching somebody play it. I'm like, well how long you been watching? He's like, per, you know, he's gonna show me how to beat it. And I'm like, that's the weirdest thing. What are you doing? And I pulled up a chair. <laughs> Two hours later, I'm like, what am I doing? Man. We watch other people's lives instead of living in our own. Remember when we used to do things like you used to go to a movie? We used to go cruise. Friendships changing. Anybody used to go cruising? Yeah, that's where we hung out. We hung out in person, not online, right? You said, we, used to, we used to do things. We used to go to these foreign places called outside. <laughs> and there's this weird place called the woods that you could actually play in. <laughs> My fear today is we have an epidemic of superficial saws and we are starving relationally. Look, look at the text. Look what it says. Look what it says. And Jonathan made a what? Say it with me. Covenant with David. Now, you need to see this. Jonathan made a covenant, and Saul makes a comparison. And you can't be who God created you to be comparing yourself to whoever, everybody else, God, what God created them to be. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as he loved his own self. And he took off his royal what? His royal robe that he was wearing, signifying where David was headed, and gave it to David along with his military tunic and even, check this out, his sword. When you would defeat somebody in battle, the, the defeated army would hand them the sword. And what Jonathan has realized is that David will be the next king of Israel. And in this moment, they make a covenant. And Jonathan and David become ride or die best friends. They become brothers from another mother. They become bros. They become comrades. They become best friends at this moment. Why did this happen? I think it happened because if you would look back at 1 Samuel 14, Jonathan and David are kindred spirits because Jonathan knew his father was apathetic. In fact, when his father was hanging out in safety in 1 Samuel 14, Jonathan is by himself, and just like David attacked Goliath, Jonathan looks at his armor bearer and says, hey, let's go over and pick a fight. Go read this also. Let's go pick a fight with this Philistine outpost. And the armor bearer is like, well, how are we going to know if God's with us? And he's like, well, I don't know, but perhaps God will move on our behalf. Now, I want some people like that in my life that will move on a maybe. I think, I think, I think Jonathan watched David stepped to Goliath. He heard his speech and think, I can roll with this dude. Oh, this dude's my kind of dude. I, 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 wanna, I, wanna, I want some friends like that. I want some friends that'll make the devil nervous. 
I want some friends in my life. I want some Jonathans in my life that'll make hell shake. I want some friends in my life that will pray with me, not just pray for me. I want some friends that know how to get a hold of heaven. I want some friends that know how to advance the kingdom. I want some friends that will leave this world gloriously tired for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Christ Almighty, and say, I did everything you assigned me to do. I want some people that'll roll with me that will enter eternity dead dog tired to the glory of God. That's what I want. Now, here's the deal. You need to understand this. Everybody can't be a covenant friend. Jonathan made a covenant with David. Everybody is not a covenant friend. If you're a teenager, you need to write that down. Everybody, Saul's are needy. Saul's are insecure. Saul's will are one-sided relationships. I hear people, I don't, I just don't have any friends. <laughs> I just don't have any friends. Maybe you're a Saul. Because if you're 47 and nobody has liked you, maybe you're the issue. Can I pastor you? Maybe you're needy and people don't want to be around needy people. I, I don't have any Jonathans in my life. Well, Jonathans don't like to hang out with Saul. Because Saul's will suck the life out of you. And if you're a Saul, we can, uh, John, we can only hang around you for so long. I don't have any friends. Well, evaluate what kind of friend you are before you start projecting and blaming and criticizing other people. Here's the question. I pose this point, not will you, will you go find a Jonathan, but will you be one? Will you be a Jonathan? See, covenant friends will go to fight for one another. Covenant friends are running in the same direction, carrying one another's burdens. I'm going, jot it, I'm, 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 going, I'm going to read it how I jotted it down. Don't get disappointed when your digital acquaintance don't live up to covenant expectations. Wow. Yeah. I don't have any friends. Well, maybe you, you have a digital friend. You don't have a covenant friend. Well, I went through, uh, yeah, it's real quiet in here, ain't it, ain't it, Neil? <laughs> Nobody can't tell me. Well, you didn't make real friendships. Nobody can call me. You didn't make real friendships. Because I'm sorry. A online friend is not a face-to-face -face friend. And let me tell you something. Online friendship is the lowest form of friendship because anybody can put a comment out there. Love you. Praying for you. Are you? Are you? Don't be upset if because your digital acquaintance didn't meet a covenant expectation. That's why you need to get in a group in this church in about a couple weeks and see if you can find a covenant friend. Now, here's the deal. I'm not here to make friendships for you. That's why not, small groups are not to build your friendships because you can't find friends somewhere else. We're here to find covenant friendships moving in the same direction. And my fear is that many of us in this room are attaching our lives to people who are not going in the same direction we are. Here's what C.S. Lewis says. C.S. Lewis said it like this. We, uh, we need a basis for friendship, not just a desire for friendship. Let me break that down in, in, in TFV version. Covenant friends are friends by choice, not friends by chance. I need, I, I need, I need to be a Jonathan. And I, and I want to hang out with Jonathans. In fact, later on in 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel uh, 23, 15. I put it in your outline. We'll throw it on the screen. This is after Saul has tried to kill David. He sees him as an enemy. Look what it says. While David was at Horesh in a desert of Ziph, he, he learned that Saul had come to take his life. Come on, you ever been to a desert season? Watch what happens. And Saul's son who, say it with me, Jonathan went to David. Oh, I need a friend like Jonathan. I need to be a friend like Jonathan. He went to David at Horesh and helped him what? Helped him find strength in God. Say it with me. Helped him what? Find strength in God. I want to be a friend that will help you find strength in God. I want to surround myself with friends who will help me find strength in God. And honestly, you can't find strength playing the victim. 
You can't find strength blaming others. You can't find strength medicating your struggle. I'm telling you, some of you in this room, it is time to be a Jonathan. It is time. I just need a John. No, it is time for you to be a Jonathan. It's time for you to be the one that stirs faith in others. It's time for you to be the strong one. It's time for you to be an encourager. It's time for you to be a giver because our greatest contribution to the faith may not be something we do. It may be someone we help. And you need to say, you know what? I'm here to be a Jonathan. I'm here to stir faith in other people. I don't come to church for me. I don't do this thing for me. It is so much bigger than me. I want to be a kingdom agent on the planet to get as many people moving in the right direction as humanly possible. Come on, you women say amen. Now, that's hard teaching, but here's the deal. Don't be a Saul. Be a Jonathan. Number two, number two, jot it down. Number two. The second thing I think is this, is our words are insights into our heart. Our words are insights into our heart. Our words matter. Come on, you ever said something you wish you hadn't said? And you thought, where did that come from? Inside you. That's where it came from. And then you even try to make it, you know, where it came from. Yeah, y'all, I do. Deep inside the resources of your soul, that's where blah, it just comes out, right? Let me say it like this. Our heart, our, our words will tell on us. Yeah. Jesus said it like this, uh, is uh, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Watch what happens. Watch what happens. When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from all the towns of Israel, and they met King Saul with singing and dancing. With joyful songs and timbrels and lyres, they, as they danced, they sang, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. Saul was what? Very angry. Very angry at this refrain because it displeased him greatly. They have credited David with, say it with me, tens of thousands, he thought. Read those two words. But me. Come on, put them, say it like that. But me, but me, with what? Only. Come on, say it like that. Say it. only. You gotta, you, y'all got to read the Bible more alive, man. What's wrong with y'all? And, 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 yeah, that's why you ain't getting nothing out of the Bible. You got to put, put, a little, put a little something, something. Yeah, come on, come on. David, t- David, with his tens of thousands, he thought, say it with me. But me, with only, with only thousands. Look at this. One more. What more can he get but the kingdom? Oh, Saul is jealous. And my mama told me jealousy was ugly. Jonathan should have been the one jealous. David's going to get his spot. Saul said, what about me? Huh? But me, look at the text, but me. How does this affect me? I need you to consider me. Oh, but me, people are the worst. Oh. But me people think they make everything about them. Everything about them. You can tell some you tell but me person like, yeah, I got a raise the other day. Oh, it was really nice, but let me tell you what happened to me one time. I was due for a raise one time. I tell you, they don't value hard work at this company because I was due for a raise about this time. I mean it's good that you got a raise. I mean, if you talk to the right people, you know and all. But me, but me? Oh, hey, but me people are the worst people to walk through pain with. Because you'll tell them something that's going on in your life, a struggle you have, and say, man, that's, that's really tough. Let me tell you what happened to me one time. Cut my leg off. It was horrible. Where'd you get that leg? Grew back. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry you had a tough day at work. <laughs> but me. But me people are content until they have a reason not to be. The problem is they find a reason everywhere. Some, some people are content with their phone until they see somebody with a new phone. Some, you know, I don't worry. I don't struggle with that. Okay, let me move on. All right, some people are content with your boat till you see other people's boat. You know where it is for me? I'm content with my airplane ticket until I see all the options for airplane tickets. <laughs> have, you, have, y'all, have you booked a flight lately? You got first class, comfort plus, comfort, main cabin. You really are too poor to fly. I mean, can you believe that? <laughs> And I love my ticket till I see everybody else's ticket. In fact, most of the time, me and Carter are looking for upgrades to Comfort Plus. Don't mind if I do. All right? 
Hey, hey, you're, you're content with your kitchen until you see somebody else's kitchen. They have double ovens. You don't use the oven you got. <laughs> Why are you worried about double ovens? <laughs> you like your house until you watch House Hunters every night at nine o'clock on HGTV. And they have a $3.7 million budget and they're a part-time barista at a coffee shop. You're like, ah! Come on, have you ever, you look, you look at me like, have you ever been content until? And Saul seemed content until he is consumed with who got the credit. Look what it is. They have, there's our issue. They credited. Oh, and he comes off the handle, y'all. Saul's jealousy blinds him to David's loyalty. So, let me, let me, je- some of you are like, I'm not jealous. Okay, jealousy is the belief that God has not blessed me as I deserve. And here's what I figured out. Jealousy and joy cannot exist in the same heart. So how do you know if you're jealous? How do you know if you're entitled? How do you know if you're a Saul? I brought some questions like I did last week. Let me, let me try to analyze some. Throw some questions up there if you got them. Let me go through some questions. Hey, pull your phone out. Jot them down. Take a picture of it. Here, 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 here will reveal your character. Can I celebrate when others are successful? Because if you can't celebrate when others succeed, they're not the problem, you are. And in fact, the problem is really not really you, it's within you. Look at the second one. Does someone else have to lose for me to win? Some of you need to jot that down for your kids. You know where I got that from? I got that when I was talking with Carter. We went out for a Father Sunday. And I asked him that question. You know why? Because I gotta ask, me, I gotta ask myself that question. Yeah. Does, does another church need to look bad for us to look good? Can you believe that goes on in the pastoral world? Yeah. I'm like, Lord, no. Does someone else have to lose? Someone have to look bad? Do you have to make a justification? Oh, I'm always on vacation. It must be nice to always be on vacation. If I had the money they had, I'd be on vacation too. Why can't it just be their own vacation? If you, can't watch social, if you can't scroll social media without having issues with this, delete social media. That's good preaching, Pastor Todd. I'm glad I got a pastor to tell me that. That's cool. That's cool. We'll probably go down to one service next week. I don't know if y'all come back for this. I don't know if y'all come back for this type of preaching. I don't. Hey, here's a good am I, am I always defensive? And here's the deal. Ask someone close to you that question. You can't answer that. You're blind to it. You're Balaam. You're Balaam. You're blind to your own weakness. Go ask your wife, your husband, your son, your daughter, your best friend, your, your, your covenant friend, your brother from another brother, your sister from another mister. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Am I always defensive? And here's the deal. If they, if they hesitate, <laughs> if they say no, but the no is a high-pitched no, 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 no. Am I, is it right? Am I telling the truth, though? Yeah. Come on and say amen. amen. Ask yourself, do I, feel, do I feel pressure to prove it? Like, we're almost out of time. Do you feel pressure to prove you're a good dad? Where, where did the pressure come from? Do you feel pressure to prove you're a good mom? And if I don't buy them the thing that everybody else has, even though it's gonna stretch me financially, you feel the pressure? Do you feel pressure to prove you're a Christian? Do you feel pressure to, do you feel pressure to prove your worth to God? Because I've been there. Where, where my identity had got wrapped up in my performance. Yeah. None of y'all been there? Yeah. I'm talking about my, my, my Christianity identity. I'm not talking about like dad and all that good stuff. I'm, I'm talking about like, I have been to the place, and we learned last week, where performance is obnoxious to God. It's almost idolatry. But I had got wrapped up in the external trappings without the internal motivation. And that's what pressure will do to you. Pressure will lie to you. And like, oh, 
You better prove it. You better prove you love God. You better prove it. Instead of proving it, I think we just need to do it. Yeah. Hey, go, go back to the slide before with our, with our text. And I know we got to go, but I want, I want to hit these two real quick. Because the, if you got your outline, circle the word but me. And then circle the word only. But me. Look at this. With only. With only. When you think it's the only thing you have, it will be the only thing you see. Oh, I only have this type of house. Oh, I only can afford this type of car. Oh, I only have so many friends. Oh, I only have one person I can count on. You see how it works out in life? I can keep going until I, my, I hit you, but I think you get it. And then it comes off the rails. Circle the two words, what more? What more? What more can you do? It's one flipping song. It's not even a whole song. It's a bridge. It's just a bridge, Brit. And this dude has lost his stinking mind from one song that David didn't write. It wasn't even David's fault. It was other. And I was like, man, this week I was, I'm mad. I'm, I was mad at Saul until I wasn't. Then I had compassion for him. Because when you look at this text, Saul is living in a prison of his own making. And uh, Jake, you can come on, we're going to close. I was mad because I began to think, I can't believe Saul would say that. I can't, David had done nothing. He had done nothing to this point in time. He will do nothing at all. In fact, David will be at a place. Saul had tried to kill him three times. Three times. David's in the cave with Saul and could kill him, but won't. Because at this point in his life, at least, his integrity is not for sale. And then I had compassion on him because when I read the text, I started seeing myself. And when I read the text, I started seeing our church. Because number three, number three, and we're done, number three, because where my eyes go, my life goes. And my fear is not that many of us in the room don't love God. I think you love God. You wouldn't be at an 8.30 service on July 31st without loving God. I think you love God, but your eyes are on people. I think we love God, but our eyes are on our desires and our stuff. Everybody tune in, tune in, tune in. I think we love God. Watch this, watch this. I think we love God, but our eyes are on our selfie. And you can't follow Jesus closely with your eyes on your selfie. Because the direction of your life will follow the focus of your eyes. Let me say it again. Somebody write it down. Come on, band. Come on, team. The direction of your life will follow the focus of your eyes. And if your eyes are on self, if your eyes are on materialism, if your eyes are even on problems, if your eyes, you will never be able to follow Jesus Authentically, you will never be able to follow God fully. You just won't be able to do it. Saul couldn't handle his own failures. What I figured out in the text is I think it was, it was easier for Saul to keep his eyes on David than it was to keep his eyes on his own self-awareness. And some of us in the room, we drifted from God. We wonder from God. Our faith is not what it used to be. What it used to be. And I just, when you're wondering what happened, I just want to say, what are you looking at? Tell me what you've been looking at. I can probably tell you what happened because drift doesn't happen by design. Drift happens because of neglect. So what's the antidote? Spent 28 minutes, 30 minutes giving you the problem. What's the antidote? 
Well, I asked the team to learn a song. And instead of me giving you the antidote to what are you looking at, oh, Britt, can you, can you close it out for us? So turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look for his wonderful face in the thing. I know this whole song. Won't you sing it? Come on, Brett. So turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things. When your eyes drift, no, no, no. My eyes are on Jesus. Turn, go on. I'm not looking at people. I'm not looking at stuff. I'm not bound by entitlement. Come on. And the things. And the things. Y'all got one more and you see it again one more time. Come on, band. Y'all jump in with them. Come on, if you believe it, stretch your hands. I'm turning. I'm turning. Oh, God, the things of this world. today, Lord. My eyes are on you. You are the Savior, Lord. You are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. God, I pray in this place today, you will help us refocus our vision, Lord. Refocus our eyes on you. God, I believe that you're all powerful. God, I believe that you're all sufficient, God. God, I believe it, Lord. God, I want my words to match the, the declaration of my heart, God. I want the Lord, I want my eyes to know you, Lord. Lord, I want my eyes to see you, Lord, because I believe that you still heal, God. Jesus, I believe that you still redeem. Jesus, I believe that in your name, demons tremble and darkness flees, God. I believe that in your name, Jesus, I believe that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that you are Lord. God, 